we be doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it is The Wrestling Life. It's episode 327. We're in the first week of February of 2023. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and the only wrestling podcast. Cody Rhodes won the Royal Rumble. Mm -hmm. It's the most viewed Royal Rumble in history, according to WWE. 51% more eyeballs on the show on Peacock than a year ago. Raw did over 2 million viewers again. The World Wrestling Federation is back, baby. Yeah, a big way. Did huge numbers all weekend from the long weekend, if you count Monday. Like, uh, SmackDown was up huge. And as you said, uh, the Rumble is the most watched history. I guess, is this just, is Peacock in more homes now? Does it feel like the product is actually hot? I mean, it makes sense to me the night after the Rumble that Raw would be up. But I don't think we've seen... Again, this is something that used to be commonplace in the olden days of like, you know, 19 in the late 90s through 2015 or so. Yeah. We used to see big bumps, especially after the big the big four pay-per-views or the big three with the Rumble, SummerSlam and, and Mania. Uh, but those kind of went away in the last few years. Um, and and now it's back and it. It did, it did feel like a hot pro, uh, product, and they took advantage of the fact that it was their most watched show in Peacock history or whatever, because they, for once, unlike on Raw the previous week, uh, the Legends, uh, the, the Anniversary Raw, which we talked about last week, where they didn't really do anything that great uh, or that big, uh, they shot they shot the biggest angle they could shoot right there. We're beginning the, uh, the road to Mania for for Roman and Sammy and the Usos and KO and whatever, all this bloodline stuff's going to, going to shake out over the two nights of WrestleMania. Uh, for once they, <laughs> they pulled the trigger on doing a big angle when they had a big audience, instead of just getting the big audience and doing nothing with it. Yeah. So how did you think the uh, Sammy Zayn bloodline angle uh, turned out? I've seen a lot of people say, is he the best or the second best angle the company's ever done? Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the bloodline exploding here? Yeah, I mean, it was really good. Um, I I didn't think it was like an all time great angle, but maybe it. You know, a lot of times that's history. <laughs> history will be the judge of that. Um, like I didn't get the same feeling I got. Say the last time WWE shot an angle that really got me excited was. Probably the the Jericho and Owens one six years ago. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's been a while. Um, so I didn't quite feel the same way there, but that could also just me being a, a bitter, jaded old man. Uh, uh, but no, I, I thought it was very, very, very good. I think it's a it's the best kind of angle you can do in the sense that you have a lot of different roads you can take now. And all of them can make sense and all of them can be good. You know, a lot of times I feel with WWE uh, booking, they kind of paint themselves into a corner unnecessarily um, where either the payoff is obvious or the payoff that they give you is not, uh, not satisfactory. Whereas here, obviously it looks like they're going to build to Sammy and Roman in uh, at the Montreal show. Um, and that whatever you play out there, you obviously had the decision to not have Jay join in on the beat down. So you can have Jay go baby face and you have Jimmy and solo be the tag team for a while. And, and they stick with Roman or Jay can, you could do the big swerve and Jay can join back with Roman. And, uh, and then you probably set up one night of WrestleMania to be main evented by, 
uh, Sammy and Kevin versus the Usos for the tag titles and night two to be main evented by Roman versus Cody. Um, I guess, and this was kind of a, su- a subject that, that we can, we can get into. A lot of people talked about it of whether or not people would be satisfied if Rome, if Roman and Sammy have a good match, but Sammy just loses and then he's out of the title picture. Will people be upset and would they turn on Cody and my thought is no, because I don't think the current WWE audience does that anymore. <laughs> like the percentage of, of people that go to televised WWE events to heckle the show <laughs> seems to have drastically decreased in the last couple of years. And I don't know that I see them hijacking a show even for, you know, Sami Zayn or 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 if WWE chooses cody to win the belts in the main event over roman and and you have uh sammy there you can even you can even tie you can even have sammy and kevin you know come down to counter the usos or solo or whoever's interference and that leads to cody winning so you can even still have it be sammy ultimately triumphing over roman it's just he's not going to be the guy with the belt because even in a triple h wwe sammy Zayn ain't getting that belt right or belts However, they do this now, like that's not a, at least not long term. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think they've set themselves up to do a lot of fun stuff and a lot of stuff that people will be really into and they can go a lot of different ways with it. So a rare two thumbs up from me to the World Wrestling Federation. What do you think of the men's and women's rumbles themselves? Um. Pretty good, I thought. The men's was, you know, they, they certainly anchored it with uh, Gunther and Sheamus being in there the longest. Um, not a lot of big surprise returns this year, uh, especially the women's one, which was like a cameo fest, as we talked about last year, because of the decision did not involve any NXT people. Um. So it was more reliant on current stars. My biggest thing, and this was a little better this year, I think. There's a lot of long stretches when these matches that go an hour where there's just nothing happening. Like a guy runs down and nobody like runs to feed him. (laughs) You know, nobody comes in and takes some moves from him. And so like Johnny Gargano ended up in the ring for like 35 minutes. Couldn't tell you a single thing he did in the match. Um, so like that's that's a small critique though. Overall, like I think it started well. You had the the middle portion with Brock, <laughs> Brock doing Brock stuff. Uh, always always a hoot. And then uh, and then you ended with a pretty fun uh, you know uh, last two of of Cody and 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 Gunther, which I really enjoyed. Feel like that's a match they could do on a on a TV or or maybe you know, on on the Montreal show. I guess Gunther's the champion, so I guess you could just do a non-title match. Um, but it seems like they were they would they would like to do more with Cody and and Gunther down the road. And then, yeah, I didn't think the women's match was outstanding, but you picked a new you picked somebody, and you made her. You know, you made it's not really a new star because Rhea has been the champion already a couple of times, but this version of Rhea really hasn't been pushed at that top level. She's mostly been a a valet and a mouthpiece so uh, you know they i think they mission accomplished i didn't think either match was like filled with filled to the brim with great moments and cool spots but there was there was good stuff in both of them and the men's one i think for it being mostly full-time acts i didn't think i didn't feel like oh my gosh this is really suffering a you know a lack of star power um for either match so you know good job and uh you know asuka coming back was uh was really fun too so there's good stuff and fun returns and you still got a couple little cameos uh, in in both rumbles so yeah good 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 stuff better better than last year for sure uh i'm being uh i'm being told that rhea ripley defeated asuka at WrestleMania 37 to win the Raw Women's Championship. I have no memory of this. That, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> uh, 
I have no memory of Rhea Ripley being the Raw Women's Champion. I remember her being the Raw Women's Champion because Charlotte came back and beat her for it. <laughs> but you, you could have given me a thousand dollars, and I couldn't have named who she who Rhea beat for the title. Rhea Ripley defeated Asuka by pinfall. Hmm. Huh. What do you know about that? Uh, Nia Jax came back in the women's trouble. People were seemed excited about that. <laughs> and she's back back. She's got new merch and everything. Yeah, um, I saw conflicting reports on that. I saw somebody say, oh, she's not back back. But they made merch for her, which usually is an indicator of it. Well, she back back. You would think, um, unless unless WWE shop jumped the gun and ink ink isn't quite dry on the on the deal yet. But I mean, we talked about it. Like it's a uh, you know you you need new people because that's what wrestling is mostly now. It's just people coming back or people debuting. So Nia Jax is a person that has been on these shows before. <laughs> And she is on, and she might, in fact, be on these shows again. So, you know, uh, much the same as Ronda Rousey, I don't think any of the matches she have uh, may have going forward will be any good. Uh, but there will be a certain sense of danger to them, which sometimes is is just as fun as an actual good wrestling match. So, you know, good luck to uh, any any and all uh, women who might be working with a Nia Jax who is now. Uh, been out of the ring for two years. A ring rust, <laughs> Nia Jax, uh, wrestling, uh, wrestling these women on Raw or SmackDown. Good, uh, you know. I wish them good fortune. She couldn't get up for. Uh, I think it was Rhea, maybe Raquel, one of the two women they push. She couldn't get up for a slam. That mm-hmm. was a bad sign. It's a really bad sign. I think more people were feeding in the men's rumble this year than. Uh, in the last couple of years, particularly last year's Shane McMahon agented mm. men's men's rumble. Um, and, uh, I don't necessarily think you had Sasha Banks or Natalia out there directing traffic and ordering people to feed as we have had in years past in the women's match. But I thought technically little things like that. The rumbles were a little bit better this year, but uh, would you think the Mountain Dew pitch black match with uh, two of your favorites, <laughs> Bray Wyatt, uh, Uncle Howdy, and uh, LA Knight? Two of your favorites, yes, two of my very favorite uh, performers. Uh, yeah, it was it was bad, but uh, it was pretty short, um, which is better than the last Bray Wyatt iteration, who was bad and had long matches. Uh, so there's that. Um, I do think it's very funny that he inspires such fervor as like this incredibly artistic, intricate uh, uh, guy who plans out all these meticulous Easter eggs and secret references and secret codes that and then his first match after like six months of standing around making spooky faces and yelling at a guy named Al- Uncle Howdy is he has a Mountain Dew match. <laughs> really, really a, a great, a great victory for the, for the artistic wrestlers out there. You too, if you put a lot of time and effort into it, can have your first match be a commercial for Mountain Dew. Not even regular Mountain Dew. A Mountain Dew that's, it's, it's purple, I think. It's very good. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, the match was bad, uh, but it was short. And then Uncle Howdy took a little fall. <laughs> he had a little touch of the disease and he fell and missed L.A. Knight completely. And then some flamethrowers went off. So uh, yeah, that was... And the, uh, and, and the puppets came to life. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Very, very important note there. The tour de force. Mm-hmm. What do you get? What do you get that guy to do for for Mania? If, assuming Vince doesn't come back and fire Bray before then, um, like what does that guy do for for WrestleMania? What spooky act? Do they call up the Schism from NXT and do a spook off? I think we might be getting Bray and Alexa against Seth and Becky. Oof, that's just that's pure speculation on my part. Well, I mean, if you do if you do have them join up, 
there aren't a lot of obvious like top star couples. Yeah. Unless it's Edge and Beth. Oh, Edge loves himself some lore. Edge, he does. And and obviously Rhea will be in the title match, so they can't do Edge and Beth versus Rhea and Dominic or Rhea and Finn there. So Yeah, that's oh that's a possibility also. Why would I speak that into the universe? <laughs> Oh, it's going to be terrible. If they ever do it, Edge and Bray Wyatt, it's going to be the worst feud in wrestling history. <laughs> Think of the promos. Ugh. So much acting. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, by the way, Nick Khan uh, on the WWE Investors Call on Thursday this week said that that was a million dollar deal for uh mountain dew Mm -hmm. and uh and they're looking at putting advertising on the uh on the turnbuckles and the aprons and the and the canvas something vince was staunchly against for many years so but uncle nick um you know before he was the ceo he was the chief revenue officer Mm -hmm. and uh i'd really like Nick Khan to read me a bedtime story, by the way. <laughs> he does have a very calming, uh, soothing voice, doesn't he? It's like a mix of um, of uh, polished business speak, and also you could tell he smoked a lot of cigars over the years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of, well, I imagine Nick, uh, Nick Khan structs a lot of sentence with, here's the thing. <laughs> Maybe so. I think he's a little more polished than that. Okay. It, it it may be some variation of that, but it's like, yes. He starts a lot of sentences by buttering up whoever asked him a question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doesn't make enemies. He does have the black soulless eyes of a shark, but he does not <laughs> make enemies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's accurate. Uh, let's wrap up the World Wrestling Federation stuff here with... Uh, they did a bunch of qualifying matches for Elimination Chamber, Austin Theory, defending the U.S. title in one chamber match. And then the uh, there's a women's chamber match on that show just coming up uh, two weeks from Saturday, uh, where the winner will wrestle Bianca Belair. So um, they've got their filler, their, uh, their filler programming for the next couple weeks. A lot of qualifying matches, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And uh, this Saturday is NXT Vengeance Day, where they will uh, uh, they will have a uh, they'll have a cage match between Braun Breaker and Australian Miz, <laughs> and Wesley will defend the NXT North American title against Dijak, and New Day will defend the tag titles against Gallus, Pretty Deadly, and Chase U. The women's tag titles will be on the line. Apollo Crews and Carmelo Hayes will be in the two out of three falls match for some reason. And Roxanne Perez will defend against uh, what's left of Toxic Attraction in a three-way match. Uh, not a big Grayson Waller guy. Not a big Jack guy, at least in this iteration. Tag match will be fun. Women's tag match. Uh, a lot of a lot of acting in the promos leading up to this between uh, Fallon Henley and Keanu James, but eh, eh, it'll be short. Paul Cruz and Carmelo Hayes in the two out of three falls match. I don't know why we're having that match, but it'll be good. And uh, Roxanne hopefully can work a miracle with uh, Gigi and JC. So uh, any thoughts on uh, Vengeance Day? Uh, so my understanding is that the the cage match was set up after they had a match on television in which the ring ropes uh, broke. Yeah, more or less. OK, I mean, I, I appreciate trying to come up with a logical reason to put these guys in a cage, you know, like. And it's not just it's not the usual reason WWE does a cage, which is that there's interference and guys keep running in which is a joke because the cage never keeps anyone from running in as we just saw on raw two weeks ago. Um, So at least they came up with a creative reason. If the ring ropes snap, 
they'll still be inside a cage. So you, you get a you get a decisive winner. So that's that's something. That's I, I appreciate that. Um yeah, my other thought was uh, Roxanne. I guess the thought was Roxanne was only in the rumble for like two minutes because they didn't want her getting hurt uh, on uh, because she had this match coming up. But I would have liked to have seen her because when she got into the ring, it's like her and Rhea and Liv and then like a bunch of bodies. <laughs> and I was like, I think Rox- Roxy is the best worker and Roxanne is the best worker in this entire match <laughs> at the moment that she stepped into the ring. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to see her uh, would have liked to have seen her given more of a chance to shine, but I also appreciate the idea of like, well, we don't want her in there 20 in, for doing spots for 20 minutes when she's got a, <laughs> what she's got to carry <laughs> two thirds of toxic attraction to a passable match next Saturday, I guess. You know, if you didn't want uh, Roxanne getting hurt in the Rumble, you could just not have put her in the Rumble. Very true. Could have put somebody else from uh, from NXT in there. Could have put... Uh, I'm sure there were other uh, luminaries and legends backstage you could have thrown in there for for the exact same amount of time. Like, how, Remember how like that one year Kurt Angle's in the Rumble for like 30 seconds, and the reason was it was because that was Zack Ryder's spot originally? And they were like, well, we'll put Kurt Angle in because he's a bigger name, but we've timed it out with this 30 second thing for Zack Ryder. So Kurt Angle, you will be in the Rumble for 30 seconds. I don't I don't remember that, but hey, Kurt, uh, anything we get out of Kurt is probably a bonus at this point. True. Just just the thought of like, yeah, if it's only a four minute spot, you could kind of just plug anybody in there you could have plugged uh i don't know i'm sure there were other nxt people backstage you could have plugged in or carmella just kind of showed up on raw you could have put her in the in the rumble sure so, um there were there were there were people <laughs> that could have filled that role other than your nxt champion if you didn't want to want to have her uh in a in a more featured spot but that's that's a little bit of nitpicking overall yeah, uh, these NXT shows are still pretty easy watches because they're about two and a half hours long <laughs> and uh, the wrestling isn't quite at the, at the level that it was in the previous versions of NXT, but, you know, there's still there, there'll still probably be good stuff. It'll be a very watchable show on Sunday, I have no doubt. Yep, there's that. All right, uh, AEW Dynamite this week. What you think of the program? It was a uh, another uh, another show where Brian Danielson had a singles match. Uh, Tony Khan has explained that in his booking sheet in Excel, he switched the rows and the columns, and since he's done that, Dynamite has been much better and much more organized. <laughs> Darby Allen and Samoa Joe tried to murder one another on television. Mm-hmm. And uh, Samoa Joseph got the TNT title back. Um, let's see. They did a their version of a show long storyline, which was two segments where uh, the Soraya, I understand, being a heel, Tony Storm's a heel for some reason, and uh, they beat up Rick Baker, and uh, that continued. And uh, Kenny Omega's back on the show after some visa problems, and. They've announced a lot of stuff for next week's show. Um, what do you think of uh, Dynamite at the uh, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's we we've discussed this a little bit lately. A lot of very good wrestling on the show, which is a good way to have <laughs> to have a good show. Even if you're like, I I don't I'm not super jazzed about the pay per view in a month. Like, first of all, because you've already told me it's going sixty minutes, which is very little wrestling. Uh, very few matches in wrestling history that I have watched that have been 60 minutes, uh, I think were good because they went 60 minutes. It might literally just be the the two Omega Okada matches. <laughs> I gen- genuinely don't know if I can name another match that went 60 minutes that I've watched that I thought was great because it went that long. Um, so that's working against it. But yeah, overall feels like you're doing something they had. They did another Hangman and Moxley match. They kind of reverse roles where Hangman's the one that 
beats Moxley down and bloodies him. And then Moxley gets like a flash pin. So you could do uh, some kind of stip match. We talked about it. It'll probably be like a, you know, some kind of street fight or something. Also, maybe you set up something where the Dark Order comes in and you do them against Moxley and Yuda and, and Claudio because they don't really have a lot going on right now. Um, yeah, and then as you mentioned, the main event, you had, uh, you had Wardlow coming back looking like uh, 2004 OVW <laughs> superstar um, with, the, with his nice new haircut. And... Uh, yeah, the match, the the Joe and Darby match was great. Joe is Joe is still very good at being Samoa Joe, <laughs> but he cannot move too good no more because he's sure. you know old and heavy and you know same here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, Darby is such a wild man and has such incredible movement and speed uh, that Joe looked like. Every time Joe is in there with Darby, he looks like the old Samoa Joe. And so I think Joe going back into a feud with a big muscle man that he can't throw around like he threw around Darby. Probably if I were Joe, I'd be like, now give me the small guys from now on. Give me small guys that can create all the movement and bump around for me. And then I'll do my two or three signature things that I can still do that look good. And uh, and then we'll just chop and and forearm the crap out of each other. Because uh, yeah, going back to wrestling the big fellas that you got to herk up for everything. Uh, maybe not going to be as good for Joe, but uh, yeah, you got. They've started as we're now about a month out, I guess. Now we're starting to uh, to get a card or a, the semblance of a card together for this uh, for this pay per view, and I guess the only thought with the women's stuff. Do you feel I've seen people talking about this? Do you feel like they're gonna do a women's blood and guts? Um, they usually do that uh a couple months down the line. Right. That's um, just like a summer thing, right? That was it was like May last year. That was my thought um when they started this. Uh new guys versus w or wwe guys versus AEW guys uh faction there in the women's mm-hmm. division that was my thought was we're getting women's blood and guts yeah well that would be uh so okay so we have i i still think ruby's gonna turn at some point so there's your third wwe woman and then maybe by then uh, we've talked about i don't know if we've talked about this on the year but my main thought of why i always thought mercedes slash sasha banks would end up in uh in AEW is because she's never going to be able to bleed <laughs> in uh in wwe and sure. uh, so i could see her coming in to be the fourth the fourth outsider there and then you have to set up your your homegrown stars which i mean you have you would assume jamie Britt and and uh, sheeta are three there and then whoever whoever can be the fourth one Perhaps the bunny, <laughs> the bunny can be the fourth one in, in that group or, or Penelope, one of the hardcore icons of, of, of AEW can, uh, can join that, can join that team. But yeah, that, that, that could uh, be exciting down the line, but as of now, yeah, the show is, it's got good wrestling, which makes the rest of the show that maybe I don't love or that I'm not enamored with easier to swallow because <laughs> Uh, that's good. Oh, and I like that John Moxley's dad was with him <laughs> this week. That was really random. Mr. Moxley. Mr. Moxley uh, was 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 part of uh, John Moxley's entrance this week. So uh, a solid one thumb up for Dynamite this week, mostly based around the wrestling. Oh, people, uh, people seem concerned with Michael Elgin, who has started a 150,000 GoFundMe campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, he needs money to live on while he gets his podcast up and running. And then obviously the podcast, yeah. the podcast is obviously going to set him up for life financially. Mm-hmm. So, um, He's also very concerned that his children in Canadian schools are not being taught about men's rights and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
at what point do we stop laughing at Michael Elgin and become concerned that this is a Chris Benoit situation uh, waiting to happen? Yeah, I think we've I think we've hit that point. I think maybe it's time to stop uh, feeding that. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, it's look, no one has had more fun over the years mocking Michael Elgin than the two of us. Uh, going back to the very early days of our show, but no, uh, it seems like a person with some very big issues. Um, that and more importantly. There's a kid involved that could be in a best case scenario is probably subject to a lot of mental anguish. And in a worst case scenario, it could be worse than that. So um, yeah, at, at, at a certain point, if, you, if some, if there are people in the wrestling industry that still talk to this guy, um, I would be trying to reach out and try to, uh, get him to seek help or contacting local child protective services or, or something because it's, it's yeah, it's unpleasant. It feels a little bit to just still mock at this point. Um, feels a little bit like in, in the olden days where you could like pay a nickel to look in the, the telescope to look down in the insane asylum or something. Um, it's what? not, <laughs> that was a real thing, but they had like, you know, like those view, those view things you could, you could like pay and go watch people like people in in asylums walk around in the like the 1800s um but point being i don't think it's helpful to point and laugh and gawk at it at this point i think uh yeah hopefully people that are closer to the situation uh will take this as a wake up call that uh, he and perhaps other people in his life are in trouble because it's, yeah, it's not funny anymore. Kota Ibushi has officially left New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's going to GCW, of course. Naturally. Said that uh, maybe he'll talk to AEW after that. Kota Ibushi is always going to do Kota Ibushi things. I think is the main <laughs> takeaway from here. And he tried being corporate Kota Ibushi for a couple of years. He tried wearing a suit and, uh, and working in office space and it just didn't work out. And um, he blames new Japan for his mother attempting to kill herself and breaking her back in the process. Mm -hmm. And um, has a lot of gripes with new Japan. And so he decided uh, he's going to leave. And his lifetime contract, as it turns out, was for like four years. So uh, he, he's gone now. And uh, he's going to be wrestling uh, GCW and uh, Joey Janela's Spurn Break, which is in a GCW production. But uh, a couple of GCW shows over WrestleMania weekend in the United States at the end of this month slash the beginning of, or the end of March, rather, slash the beginning of April. Uh, Kota Ibushi's gone. And Okada is defending against Shingo Takagi this weekend uh, at uh, night three of the new beginning, which is just <laughs> this tour is like ugh, this tour is not been good. And it also has gone on forever. So there's that, too. Uh, any thoughts on uh, the Japan scene here? Yeah, I mean, the Ibushi thing, it's just fascinating that of all the places that could have gotten abushi first that it's gcw um i guess they've worked with some new japan guys before like suzuki has done shows for them and and osprey came in to do the nick wayne match but um obviously he's not new japan anymore so i guess he can work wherever he wants but um yeah i guess the obviously the most interesting thing would be i it seems like maybe he doesn't want a contract anywhere <laughs> Yeah. As you said he he gave that he tried to travel down that road and it didn't work out. Yes. Uh, to say the least. So uh I wonder would there be harsh hard feelings from New Japan if AEW tried to book him even on a part-time basis or just brought him in to do, you know, the reuniting with Kenny and you do, you know, they go for the tag titles or something. Like could they do that without pissing off pissing off new japan 
Uh, I would think they could. Okay. I don't think there's a ton of heat from New Japan towards Ibushi. There's probably some, mm-hmm. but I always thought the guy got the impression that the heat there was more Ibushi towards New Japan. Right. And based on what he's accused him of, I, uh, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I thought that the company caused the things that he claims. Yeah, they caused. I would be a little bit. I'd be a bit cross with them myself. So, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that I guess that's the as soon as as soon as Kota Bushi free agent there, it's like yeah, I'm sure every wrestling company in the U.S. is going to want to base uh, is going to want to book him. So, how much time does he want to spend in the U.S.? How much money does he is he going to want to work in the U.S.? And, uh, you know, will he pop up in some of these smaller promotions in Japan in the meantime? He's going back to DDT or or, or some of these other promotions in the meantime. It's uh, the world is Kota Ibushi's oyster, really. But uh, it really is. <laughs> but yeah, it'll be exciting to see him back. He's one of the best professional wrestlers of all time. And it'll be great to see him uh, back in the ring for the first time. It'll be I guess if he doesn't wrestle before then, it'll be almost he got hurt in the G1, right? Yeah. In 21, so not quite two years, but you know, year and a half. Yeah, yeah, year and a half. That's still a long time. So it's going to be exciting. Like that, that show is probably whatever the the first one he wrestles on over Mania weekend is is going to probably have more eyeballs on it than it otherwise would have as part of just the the GCW menagerie that they run over Mania weekend every year. Like that's a name that'll actually probably get you know drive uh drive some uh some fight buys for them sure i think too you know 40 years old new japan probably the worst place you could work as an <laughs> older as an older wrestler whose uh body is maybe started to turn on you new japan the absolute worst schedule in the world if you're that person mm-hmm. as <laughs> so. evidenced by why <laughs> Tetsu and Naito barely being able to <laughs> to walk and why like Kenta and Jay White fled the country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and only work strong now <laughs> for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah. Look at 45 year old 46 year old Tanahashi. Look at the uh, you know 46, 47 year old E. It's like, yeah, it's probably to Ubushi's long term benefit that he got it out of there. So one more sad note this week, the loss of the genius sleeping Lanny Poffo. Um, Lanny was a little bit before my time as a as Lanny Poffo as a wrestler, where he was like an opening match mm-hmm. underneath Babyface at WWE. I've since gone back and watched a lot of that stuff on primetime wrestling uh, since then. Lenny was great. Lenny was ahead of his time. Um, he was busting out moonsaults and stuff in the opening match in 1986. Sure. Like you can imagine. <laughs> in, in 1986 WWF, you didn't see a lot of moonsaults. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. A lot of punching and kicking and squeezing, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, and he was still doing weird Lanny stuff like he would come out with uh, he would read a poem off a Frisbee and then he would throw the Frisbee into the crowd. Um, He was a strange cat, you know, (laughs) Uh, you get you got the impression in his later years that maybe he was paying for the company of young ladies, Mm. um, which, you know. It's the oldest profession. I don't know. Like, I. I always thought Lanny's proclivities may have run the spectrum. So I was kind of surprised when he'd see like a picture of Lanny with like a 24 year old Russian girl. Like, <laughs> no, I didn't know Lanny. I didn't know Lanny went that way. Um, of course, he um, he famously um, could uh, fillet himself. That <laughs> um, was a story. It was a story. From the WWF locker room days, he uh, the, the urban legend was he had a rib removed so that he could fillet himself, <laughs> like, like he was at Marilyn Manson or whoever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was uh, that's that wasn't true, by the way. He was just naturally really flexible and he could uh, S his own D. <laughs> so, 
there's that Lanny story. Uh, Lanny is the genius as like, uh, I don't think Mr. Perfect needed anything to get more heat, but, uh, you know, I could understand with 1988, 1989 eyes looking at Kurt Hennig and saying, you know, maybe not the greatest world wrestling federation promo. So they put Lanny as a, uh, as a, um, very flamboyant, uh, effeminate, Mm -hmm manager with uh with with perfect and so that hulk hogan could do some um gay bashing <laughs> uh for heat mm-hmm. you know it was a different time it was the uh it was the 80s and 1990 and that was a different time in uh in american culture and in the world wrestling federation and um lanny would be out there prancing around ringside and uh he he really worked with uh with the perfect act um he t- took the poetry gimmick and made it a heel gimmick and i think he famously beat hogan uh by count out on a saturday night's main event mm-hmm. and they had uh, him sitting in wcw all those years hogan never got his win back no he got uh, landy got mailbox money <laughs> mm-hmm that he was he was signed for like 150 grand a year in the mid to late 90s and they never used him it was like Randy Savage's contract was paid for by a slim by his slim jim deal if you uh, believe Eric Bischoff mm-hmm. and so Randy from time to time would ask for favors like he would ask that uh you know they put his dad in the WCW Hall of Fame his dad could get a payday and get a little recognition and they asked if they would, uh, you know, cut Lanny a check. And so, um, you know, Lanny was on the WCW payroll and they never really used him. So I think Lanny, Lanny ended up uh, financially very well off and uh, always spoke very glowingly of his brother mm-hmm. on any uh, WWE production. And, uh, of course, had a very famous one weekend run as a New Japan uh, commentator <laughs> here in this in this century. And it was kind of, uh, it was, I mean, he was horrible at the job. He had no product knowledge. He was woefully past his expiration date and uh, made no effort to, uh, to learn the product or to, or to be good at it. Uh, but Lanny, uh, it was kind of a shame. It was like, hey, you know, there should be a spot in wrestling for somebody like Lanny Poffo. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that spot was not the New Japan World commentary booth. <laughs> In the uh, in the twenty teens, so uh, those are kind of my Lanny Poffo thoughts. And uh, sixty eight is too young to go, but uh, Lanny, uh, Godspeed, Lanny Poffo. Yeah, absolutely, a great character. And there's something that whatever uh, Miss Miss uh, <laughs> whatever shortcomings uh, Randy Savage had as a person, which seems like there were a lot. Um. Yeah. He was very, he was obviously very much loved and was very loyal to and made sure his brother and parents were taken care of for his whole life and seemed like they had a very loving familial bond, even if the rest of Randy's life was uh, a bit of a shambles. So always seemed like, yeah, like Lanny, like there was a lot of love in, in the Pafo family. Um so yeah, it's it's sad, it's sad that someone someone died so young. And yeah, great, yeah, great character in in every sense of the word. I urge everyone, if you have a lot of free time and you can't sleep, <laughs> uh, like I often do, uh, throw on prime prime time wrestling. There's like a better if you throw on any prime time wrestling show from eighty six to eighty seven. There's a better fifty percent, ch- better than fifty percent chance that you're going to see. The opening match on the show is going to be Lanny Poffo uh, doing a really good match with uh, a an, a uh, Mike Sharp or uh, preliminary WWF heel of the era, and it's going to be great. So go check that stuff out. All right, anything else you want to get into? No, I think we've uh, we've kind of run the gamut there, but it's WrestleMania season, and there will be lots to talk about in the coming weeks. So looking forward to it. Heck yeah. All right. Uh, Until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. And we'll be back soon with more stories from the rest of my life. Bye-bye.
Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. I hope uh, the Papa family is... uh... Moved to tears by my tribute about Lenny blowing himself. <laughs> we forgot to work in that picture where he has the TV suspended on his ceiling <laughs> and he's laying in his bed. I mean, that's that's goals. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> it's like the only thing I'm missing in my life. Laying in like a water bed with <laughs> with a giant flat screen TV suspended from the ceiling. <laughs> Incredible. What an incredible man. Just couldn't be bothered to set up. <laughs> <laughs> like, why didn't you hang it on the wall? You know? I don't know. Well, you know, maybe a bad neck from all the all the bumps over the years. And his doctor told I him guess. to lay flat when he's in bed. So what are you gonna do? Not sure. watch television? <laughs> <laughs> or are you gonna <laughs> I just I just want to be like the fly on the wall in the room when the contractor came in and he's like, you want us to do what? <laughs> I want you yes. to set up a television against the ceiling <laughs> so that I may lay flat on my back and watch my old <laughs> wrestling matches while laying in bed. All right, man. It's your Why movie. did you wait until after we're off the air? To... Why did you wait until after we're <laughs> off the air to to? to... Demonstrate the greatest landing Poffo impression I've ever heard. <laughs> they, he has a very, uh, a very. I feel like even maybe more so than Randy, because you don't need the rasp to do, to do him. <laughs> it's just like the cadence and this kind of strange, yeah. like you just like kind of puff up your chest when you talk like Lanny Poffo, but also it's all through the nose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tremendous. I'll have to keep that one in the chamber for <laughs> I don't know how many more times Lanny <laughs> Poffa will come up as a topic on our show, but <sighs> you know what I was thinking about today? <laughs> as I as I am want to do. Do you remember the early 2000s uh Visa ad campaign featuring Jarek Jeter and George Steinprinter? Yes. Uh, I don't. I forget why. I think someone said the word carousing <laughs> today at work. Yes, and that's made me think of George Steinbrenner, uh, ch- chastising Derek Jeter for spending so many nights out carousing with his friends. Yes, and it raised some interesting questions. One was George Steinbrenner like a celebrity <laughs> that belonged in a national ad campaign? Mm, probably not. Okay. Because you, you would think, okay, like if they got Joe Torrey or like another player, it would make more sense to me. But whatever, that's fine. I was, was he on? Was George Steinbrenner on Seinfeld? Um, Larry David was. played him on Seinfeld. Okay, but Steinbrenner himself was not actually on Seinfeld. Okay, okay. So yeah, I was trying to figure out why he was even in the commercial. And two, and not to not to you know mock a man. It sounds like he just had a little bit of a lisp when he said the word friends, which is fine. But he kept saying friends. There's multiple commercials. I lo- I just watched them on YouTube, and he says friends in every one. And I was like, did nobody? Because he's a very powerful rich man, did nobody correct him? Was this the only usable take they got? I would like to commission a. <laughs> nine part documentary series about the making of these commercials and find out <laughs> find out what happened and uh and and why uh, it was allowed to uh to air on national television <laughs> in the state that it was i support this thank you <clears throat> it's, it's my passion project it's my <laughs> it's my white whale I try to keep on keeping on.